At 3.20 p.m. on November 6, 1996, a young woman called the local Irvine Police Department to report that two intruders had entered her apartment with guns and duct tape in tow. She didn't know what their end goal was, but she was obviously terrified as, already, they had restrained her roommate and they appeared to be searching the unit. Were they there for her? Were they looking for items to steal? Do they even know she's there? And if they found her, what exactly were their intentions? Those were all of the thoughts running through Sunny Han's mind at that moment, but for as much as it might have overwhelmed her while it was happening, she could have never imagined that the person who sent the assailants to her home was none other than her twin sister. Yes, the armed men had been sent there by Jean Han, and her instructions for them were to kill Sunny on sight. This is Monsters. Identical twins Sunny Han and Gina Han, who went by Jean, were born in South Korea to Bo Jun Kim and Yun Ho, a couple who by that point were already struggling to keep their marriage from falling apart. When a couple of children were added to the mix, it only made things that much harder, and in the end, it was going through this experience that caused Ho to realize they couldn't keep living an unhappy lie any longer. Both of their lives and their daughter's lives would be better off overall if they split up. Of course, Kim was more hesitant to allow this to happen, as during her own childhood in Incheon, her family had been torn apart when her father abandoned her and her five siblings, leaving her mother to raise them alone. Understanding the effect such things could have on a young developing mind, she didn't want to expose her daughters to a similar situation if she could avoid it. In the end, though, it was simply unavoidable and that's why, after some more time had passed, she agreed with her husband that a separation was the best course of action. Now that they had agreed on this, the next question was what would happen to the children. After all, each parent wanted to have the opportunity to raise them and there was no reason to believe either was incapable of doing so. In most situations, it would be the mother who got custody of the children, with the father either getting visitation rights or splitting custody himself on certain days of the week. That said, not wanting to stop her now ex-husband from getting the chance to fully raise his children, Kim would come to an arrangement with Ho that saw each of them take one of their daughters, effectively separating them for the next three years. This begs the question, what parents would separate their identical twins? It's something I always thought was a major plot hole in the movie The Parent Trap. No parent would do that, but I stand corrected. At least in this case, they didn't move them half a world apart and then never tell the other that their twin existed. What the hell was up with that? While Sonny and Jean would have no direct contact with each other during this time, the whole incident would ultimately do a lot to sow the seeds of a rivalry between them. This was because, from that point on, there would always be the question of why each one was chosen by their respective parents. Was Sonny thought of as more important to her father than Jean was? Did Jean have something special to which her mother didn't see in the other sister? Most siblings develop a rivalry of sorts over the years, but this was different. This was more than just who was better at getting their parents' attention on any given day. This was about being chosen as the child they wanted to keep. Of course, by the time they turned three, they'd both be living together with their mother again after she obtained sole custody of them. But by that point, the rivalry had already begun to blossom, and it would continue to develop as their teen years started to come around. Though at this point, the stage would be different as they'd no longer be living in South Korea. Deciding that her and her children would have better opportunities in the United States, Bo Jun Kim emigrated with them, taking them to Orange County, California, and forcing them to leave their old lives behind in the process. This would only further add to the feud between the two girls as, now finding themselves in an unfamiliar land where they, at least initially, didn't understand the language or the culture, they'd be forced to try to build a new life for themselves. They would compete with each other when it came to not only obtaining friends and romantic partners, but also when it came to who was getting the best grades at school. While it's still hard to see how things got to the point where hits would be taken out, 
it's easy to see how what could have been a very normal and very natural sisterly rivalry was amplified to such extreme levels so early on. It certainly wasn't made any easier for them by the fact that their mother had by this point developed something of a gambling problem, a problem that wasn't easy to fund on her meager salary as a cocktail waitress. On top of that, she had been struggling with mental health issues for some time, though as a result of the stigma she felt about being an East Asian going through this, she chose not to get any help and instead worked through it herself by jumping from boyfriend to boyfriend and sinking further into addiction. This meant times of hardship for the girls during their teenage years as, with there often being little money to go around, and it not being uncommon for their mother to leave them alone for days at a time while she went away on gambling trips, it meant the two were forced to learn how to fend for themselves. This actually forced the twins to work together more, and despite how it may seem so far, the two were actually very close throughout their formative years. Sure, there was a rivalry there, one which could get intense at times, but with both realizing from an early age that they would have to rely on each other to survive, they created a bond which was almost impossible to breach. Of course, eventually having each other wasn't enough, and with Kim growing increasingly distant and incapable of fulfilling her duties as a mother, she eventually decided that the best thing for the sake of her children was for them to be sent away once more. In 1990, she sent the twins to live with their aunt and uncle in nearby Campo where they would, for the first time, feel the benefit of a stable household. This stability would of course prove to be a benefit for them, because from there, each would do well while studying at Mountain Empire High School, with both of them graduating as co-valedictorians in their senior year. Despite how well they were now doing outwardly, and how much their experiences had caused them to develop a strong bond with one another, there was still a lot of underlying tension between the two. In fact, at one point this tension would manifest itself in dramatic fashion when, while the siblings were still 15 years old, Sonny would stab Jean in her left thigh after the two had started an argument with each other which clearly got out of hand. It seemed as if Jean, feeling like her sister was the favored child, had grown even more jealous of Sonny by this point. After all, in her mind, it always seemed like she was the one taking the brunt of her mother's angry outbursts. Outbursts which would happen every time she lost money while gambling or was forced to confront the reality that yet another romantic relationship was coming to an end. This had led to a series of arguments between the twins with the last one almost ending in disaster. Even if this was a little too close for comfort, it did at least alert others to the fact that there were larger issues going on with the girls and that, underneath their veneer of loving sisters, there was more going on. That was certainly the opinion of Jean Buckman, a family friend who would later go on the record as saying that, with regards to Sonny and Jean, quote, they didn't know the difference between wants and needs, because half of the time, they didn't have what they needed, so their wants got out of control. This gives us a window into the psychology of the two at this point, in particular the psychology of Jean. Being the youngest sibling by mere minutes and the clear inferior child in their mother's eyes as far as she believed, she would always have a complex about how the world looked at her in comparison to her twin. When they left school not long after this and Sonny went on to study at the University of Laverne on a scholarship, Jean would feel even lesser by comparison as she would remain working at a restaurant instead, having to save up money for her own college studies while there. Eventually, after giving up on any hopes of being able to afford that, she instead decided to switch up career paths to something she felt more worthy of. This new career path would see her enlist in the Air Force not long after passing the U.S. citizenship test while she was still just 20 years old. Unfortunately for her, though, this would prove to be a poor decision as, only one month after being sent to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas to start basic training, Jean would come to realize she wasn't cut out for military life. The environment was just too strict for her, not allowing her any of the freedoms she'd grown accustomed to in her youth. And with her not having the support network of her sister there to help guide her through the process either, she grew more and more emotionally unwell over the course of her spell in the military across the next two years. While she was feeling lower and more useless than she ever had in her life, her sister Sunny was continuing to excel at college. Maybe that's why they grew more distant at this point, 
feeling too ashamed of where she was in life to speak to her sister, Jean would barely attempt to make any contact with her. In fact, during this time, the two would only speak over the phone once or twice. With things looking pretty grim, Jean would at this point attempt to get out of her military service when she claimed her father was ill and that she needed to go care for him. When this failed, she instead decided to play into the don't ask, don't tell policy that the U.S. had implemented when it came to dealing with homosexuality in the service during the Clinton years. This basically meant that someone could no longer be asked if they were homosexual while they were part of the military as it was felt that, if they were forced to come out of the closet, they may be subject to discrimination. Of course, the flip side to this was that they weren't supposed to talk about being gay either, something that many LGBTQ advocates at the time felt was a mistake as it forced them into a situation where internal issues over coming to terms with their sexuality might fester. Even if they could no longer be kicked out completely as a result of their preferences so long as they weren't open about them, this was still a time when the treatment of homosexuals was not as progressive as it is now. As far as Jean was concerned, none of that mattered to her. The only thing that mattered was there was a loophole that could be exploited which would possibly allow her to gain her freedom once more. Pretty soon after that, she met with one of her commanding officers to tell them she was gay and that, as a result, they were going to have to discharge her. Following that, once she was let out of her commitments, the increasingly erratic Jean would struggle to maintain a stable civilian life. While her sister was supposedly driving expensive BMWs and wearing only the best high-end designer clothes as the result of her success at college, Jean, like her mother before her, found it difficult to hold down a job. Even when she did gain employment as a blackjack dealer at the Barona Resort and Casino just two hours south of where she had been stationed before, this would end up causing even greater stress for her as, again like her mother before her, Jean would start to develop a gambling problem. Needless to say, working at a casino where it was very easy for her to spend her earnings in quick fashion was just about the worst thing for her at this point. That was where her criminal activities really began to take hold as, now always in need of more money to fund her expensive habit, she'd take to stealing money from both friends and family. By 1996, she had stolen around $40,000 in total, with part of this number being made up of fraudulent checks and credit cards she had taken from anyone she could. Realizing how deep in the hole she was and feeling like there was no one else she could confide in anymore, Jean attempted suicide when she overdosed on sleeping pills not long after. This attempt would prove to be unsuccessful and instead she woke up in a hospital bed a few days later, only to be informed that her uncle had reported her to the police over $10,000 she had stolen from him. After that, she was arrested and subsequently sentenced to both 10 days in jail and 3 years probation as a result of her crime, with an additional ruling demanding that, on top of this, she also pay restitution for her uncle. It must have felt like it couldn't get any worse for the younger twin at this point, but as it turned out, there was a light at the end of the tunnel because it would be here that Sonny finally reunited with her. After hearing what had happened, she reached out to tell her sister she could come and live with her at her apartment in Orange County. Once at Sunny's apartment, much to her surprise, Jean would discover that, despite the impression she had been presenting to the world, her twin sister's life was not as perfect as it seemed. As a relatively poor child, Sunny had often struggled to keep up appearances throughout this time as she wanted to look like she was living a lifestyle comparable to her fellow students. Eventually, though, the pressure of trying to keep this up led to her grades slipping and her losing her scholarship as a result, forcing her to leave the University of Laverne and enroll in a cheaper community college. And when this proved to be too much for her, Sunny dropped out altogether and found work as a receptionist. So in reality, this reunion wasn't just about helping Jean out. It was about allowing the sisters to have a fresh start, with each having the other to support them again. They felt like the world was their oyster once more. The only problem was that the sibling rivalry had never fully gone away, so before long they were regularly at each other's throats again, with Sunny kicking Jean out on a number of occasions on account of her not doing enough to help around the household. So bad did things get, in fact, that in May of that year, local police were called to the apartment when a violent fight broke out between the twins. 
While Jean was concerned she was going to get arrested again at this point, it would turn out to be her sister who was taken away in cuffs. Unbeknownst to the younger twin, there was a warrant out for Sonny's arrest. It turned out that it wasn't just Jean who had gotten herself involved in crime as three years prior. Sonny had stolen a friend's credit card and gone on a $1,300 shopping spree with it. She was still trying to keep up with the lifestyle of her peers at the time, and given she didn't have the same kind of money available through her family as they did, she felt this was her only way of doing so. Rather than accepting responsibility for this, though, Sonny instead refused to accept that she had done anything wrong. Instead, she argued that she assumed her friend was so rich, she wouldn't mind missing out on a little bit of money. Can't argue with that logic, right? On top of that, since it had been the fight with her sister that caused the police to catch her, Sonny took out the majority of her anger on Jean, with her calling her sister from jail and threatening to kick her out once she got home. Jean was so angry at the way she had been spoken to, she used the fact that her and her twin were identical in appearance to her advantage as she stole Sonny's ID, credit card, and car, then went on a shopping spree of her own. But this was more than just an act of revenge, of course. It was a chance for Jean to briefly leave her own messed up life behind and be someone else for a while. Someone who, at least to an outside observer, was successful and happy. It was pure wish fulfillment, and given how poorly her life had been up to this point, understandable, even if it remained a bad decision in the long run. The reason being, after stealing cash out of her sister's account, then driving up to an ex-boyfriend's house and subsequently stealing checks from him too, Jean would find herself in trouble with the law all over again. This time, it was her turn to get caught and formally charged by the authorities, and with Sonny refusing to help her despite her pleas, Jean was sentenced to six months in jail with an added work furlough which gave her five hours a day to leave the prison facility. So, she got caught stealing from her sister and then expected that same sister to help her get out of it? Classic. Of course, the decision to allow her furlough would prove to be a poor one in hindsight because not long after this, Jean would go on the lam. Since she blamed her sister for her imprisonment, she started to develop a plan to get even. So, Sonny was arrested for a crime that had nothing to do with Jean, but blamed her for the arrest. Then Jean stole money from Sonny and blamed her for that arrest. These are two horribly selfish and irresponsible people, but only one of them would take their rivalry to a deadly level. Jean ended up finding a place owned by two sisters named Nikki and Rita in El Cajon where she could lay low for a while. Then she came into contact with a 16-year-old boy named Archie Bryant. Quickly, the two became fast friends as, with each going through a lot of struggles up until that point, there was an instant kinship between them. In fact, like Jean, Archie had gone through a particularly troublesome home life, with his family being heavily involved in the crack cocaine scene. Up until then, his only real escape had been through his best friend, 14-year-old Jonathan Sawyerath, who went by Yoshi. When he met this beautiful Korean-American woman who was six years his senior and now living on the same street as him, he became intoxicated. Not necessarily in a romantic sense, though. No, it was different than that. There was an air of danger around Jean, something of a free spirit that was hard to put into words. As the days and weeks went on, the two would grow even closer, and it was here that the forbidden idea, which had up until then only been percolating inside Jean's head, started to formulate into a reality when she noticed a wound on Archie's foot. Upon asking him about this injury, Archie told her this was where he had accidentally shot himself, and just like that, a light bulb went off and everything suddenly fell into place. This young kid had access to guns. She casually asked him if he could get her a weapon too, with her reasoning being that it was simply for self-defense. Seeing nothing wrong with that, Archie took the request to his cousin where, in exchange for $60 of Jean's money, he brought her back a two-shot Derringer pistol. Now, it should be emphasized here that this 16-year-old boy was still relatively innocent in the situation at this point in time. While he was the one who ultimately sourced Jean the gun, he had no idea what she planned to use it for. If he had known then, the likelihood is that he would have walked away. She was cool and exciting and everything he was looking for in life, but at the end of the day, no matter who she was, he didn't want to get wrapped up in a murder. Needless to say, neither did his best friend Yoshi, 
That's what made Jean's next actions all more manipulative, because, perhaps seeing the developing hero worship the two had for her by then, she took the opportunity to fully set her plan in motion when they asked her if she could give them a ride to school one morning as they were running late. Of course, while she immediately agreed to this, it soon became clear that Jean had no intention of taking Archie and Yoshi to school that morning. Instead, she suggested they take an hour-long drive with her to Irvine, with her excuse being that she needed to stop by her sister's apartment and pick up a few things. Seeing an opportunity to skip school for the day and go on an adventure with someone who was, by comparison, a cool adult, both boys jumped at the chance. And who could blame them given what they knew at the time? After all, as Archie would later put it himself, quote, I didn't care about missing school. I had no parents to answer to. Their decision was also helped by the fact that she offered them $100 for helping her out that afternoon, something she surely knew would seal the deal and in hindsight may have represented her way of trying to spread out the guilt by telling herself she had bought their services. And in hindsight, might have represented her way of trying to spread out the guilt by telling herself she had purchased their services. Still, even if they were now directly tied into what was happening, as they drove off at that point, the two boys continued to remain oblivious as to what their immediate future held. It wouldn't be until they were on the road for a while that things finally started to present themselves, as it was here that Jean began explaining the dangers she'd gone through while previously living with her sister in Irvine. The dangers she explained were far different from reality, though, because instead of telling Archie and Yoshi about the toxic relationship she and Sonny had developed, she instead spun them a yarn about Asian gangsters assaulting her and causing her to flee the city for her own safety. With this bombshell now having been dropped, Jean asked the boys if they were able to handle themselves in a fight. She explained that it may be necessary as there were likely still some of those same gangsters looking for her in the area. While this probably spooked Archie and Yoshi to some extent, by that point they were so far into the situation that they seemed only too happy to continue, caught up as they were in what they saw as the romantic chaos of Jean's past life. It must have been like being in a movie for them in some ways. That was why they didn't think twice when, once in Irvine, Jean stopped at a Ralph's grocery store to pick up some duct tape, twine, gloves, and most confusingly without context, a single potato. As far as they were concerned, though, once she explained away these purchases as being related to the threat of Asian gangs coming after her, they took her at her word. They trusted her. And though this trust would prove to be a mistake, it was enough for them to continue on the journey, as she got back into her car and drove them to San Joaquin Marsh, a quiet 300-acre wildlife sanctuary where they could do some target practice without the worry of anyone seeing them. As crazy as it may sound to someone looking in from the outside, by this point, Jean's cult of personality had seen her convince both boys, in particular Archie, to protect her with a gun should the situation arise. And of course, he had clearly fired a weapon before since that was the reason for the scar on his foot. But that said, there's a big difference between accidentally unloading a weapon while fooling around with it and deliberately taking aim at another person something which there's no evidence to suggest he had ever attempted before. Despite coming from a troubled family, Archie was by all accounts a kind and gentle boy, someone who wouldn't have hurt a fly himself. Or at least that's what people thought of him, because when later explaining why he chose to take up Jean on her offer of target practice, using the potato as a makeshift suppressor, he would reply, quote, Name one teenage boy who wouldn't want to use that opportunity to fire a gun. There was no deep-seated conspiracy, I was just a kid being a kid taking advantage of the moment. Perhaps while he wasn't the kind of kid likely to commit a murder, Archie wasn't as gentle as he seemed. In fact, it may be true that there was a daredevil side to him all along, and this probably being one of the things which attracted him to Jean in the first place. And she certainly took full advantage of this, as from there, the three drove over to Sonny's place at the San Marco apartments, with Jean once again using the fact that she was an identical twin to her advantage when she walked into the leasing office, pretending to be her sister and asking for a spare key as she had lost hers. Unfortunately for her, though, the staff member on shift would see through this ruse, so instead, Jean would be forced to find another way inside. 
As it happens, what she came up with on the spot was to drive Archie and Yoshi to a nearby store where they could pick up some women's interest magazines, such as Vogue and Cosmopolitan, all with the intention of returning to Sunny's apartment and posing as magazine salesmen. Jean wanted them to use this tactic to find out if Sunny was home alone, but that hadn't been part of the plan which was worrying the boys by now. What was mostly on their minds was the fact that, prior to returning, the now increasingly erratic-sounding Jean had asked them if they were willing to kill her sister. And it wasn't the first time she had asked someone this, as, immediately after getting out of prison, she had approached a number of different friends about their possible willingness to carry out such an act. While all of those people had turned her down, Jean felt pretty confident in her belief that Archie and Yoshi would finally be the ones to help her out. Of course, both boys initially said no to this, with them being taken aback by the bluntness of the request. Upon realizing the potential danger of the situation they were in, however, Archie would have a change of heart. Now, this may seem like a complete 180 in decision-making, but it shouldn't be forgotten that, like any good narcissist looking to manipulate someone, Jean had quietly been laying the groundwork for this all day, first with the offer to skip school and join her on a cross-town trip, then by taking them for shooting practice and finally by dropping the bombshell on them. It's a tactic that's been used many times in the past and, as Archie himself later suggested, if this girl was willing to have a hit placed on her own sister, what was she likely to do with them should they not comply? It certainly wasn't something they wanted to find out the answer to, so, agreeing to go along with the plan, Archie would take the gun from her, signaling that he was in. What she didn't realize, though, was that, Despite now being scared of what she was capable of, Archie had no intention of killing anyone. Instead, his main concern was not only about keeping both he and his friends safe, but also the woman in the apartment who had no idea what her own sister was currently plotting. In order to do this, though, he would have to at least partially play along, with him believing at this point that if he merely scared Sonny, Jean would think this was enough and would allow them to go home. At this point, upon returning to Sunny's apartment, Archie and Yoshi went up to her door and knocked. Unfortunately, though, it was Sunny's roommate Helen who answered, causing the would-be hitmen to retreat as Jean tried to calm them down by taking them out for lunch. But that didn't mean she was done with her plan because, just a few hours later, she forced the boys to try again, with her this time instructing them not to take no for an answer. Archie and Yoshi returned to the unit, and after Helen answered the door a second time and once again politely declined their offer of a magazine subscription, the boys forced their way into the apartment. According to Archie, he still had no intent of killing anyone inside, but realizing they had to do something, he held his gun to Helen's temple while his friend tied her hands with twine and placed duct tape over her mouth. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the apartment, Sunny was just stepping out of the shower. Hearing what was going on in the other room, she immediately picked up her cell phone and dialed 911, letting the Irvine Police Department know that two intruders had entered her apartment and they had guns and duct tape. With Jean outside in the car waiting to receive confirmation of her sister's assassination, and Sunny hiding inside her own apartment, terrified for her own life but having no idea that it was her sister who ordered the hit, the teen boys started searching for their target. Once Archie discovered her with her phone in her hand, he would take her at her word when she said she hadn't used it to call the police. Instead, he also tied her up and made both women sit in the bathtub though by now it was clear to Sonny that both he and his associate were just as terrified as she was, perhaps even more so. In a way, what was taking place inside this home on that afternoon was the result of a careful chess game being played out by Jean Hahn as, while she continued to sit outside, awaiting news that her task had been completed, all the pieces she had so carefully manipulated were falling apart, each of them just as scared as the other. Her plan would ultimately fail, though, because as Yoshi was running outside to tell her it was safe to come into the apartment, the police were arriving on the scene. At this point, now realizing she was at risk of being caught, Jean played dumb with the cops, asking if everything was okay and claiming to be her sister, Sunny. Meanwhile, back inside, Archie saw the red and blue lights and, immediately understanding what was going on, he untied both Sonny and Helen, trying to play the whole thing off as a practical joke. 
But things had gone too far to simply brush off as a practical joke by now, and he was trying to make his escape from the scene when he was tackled by a police officer and arrested. Even with the cops entering the building and discovering the scene, they had no idea just how crazy the situation was. And we know this because, with Jean still claiming to be her sister at this point, she was actually allowed to go free, something she quickly did with Yoshi in tow. As she was leaving, she would look in her rearview mirror one more time and see Sunny being taken out of the apartment. It was this sight which immediately brought a wave of mixed emotions over her as the reality of what she had almost done finally hit home. It's easy to call Jean Han evil in this situation, but if what she says is to be believed, something I have a hard time doing, she really did feel remorse at this point. It apparently wasn't enough remorse to turn herself in or try to help Archie because she quickly decided that she needed to get out of the country as soon as possible. Immediately from the scene of the crime, she began racing towards the Mexican border, hoping against hope that she could get there before the cops realized she was the assailant. Of course, if she was going to do this though, she would need money. So, still having her sister's identification, she used it to withdraw $5,000 from Sonny's account at a bank in Laguna Beach just an hour later. Yep, real remorseful. A couple of hours after that, she also completed a credit application to buy a 300ZX sports car from a Nissan dealership in San Juan Capistrano. While this purchase was waiting to be approved, the fleeing criminal took Yoshi back to the rental agency she'd borrowed her current vehicle from, fully unaware that by then the cops had figured everything out and were waiting for her. After investigators spoke to Archie and got the full story, the San Diego Police Department was able to piece together what had happened that afternoon. So, when Jean and Yoshi arrived at the rental agency soon after, officers were there to arrest her and search her car, finding a bullet casing which matched those loaded in the Derringer in Archie's possession. While the details of the case would come as a shock to local law enforcement, it would be an even bigger shock to Sonny herself. Sure, she and her sister had gone through their issues over the years, and at points this had even led to them having major falling outs. That said, even after she'd threatened to kick her sister out of her apartment and out of her life, she had no idea Jean would be capable of doing something like this. To know that her own flesh and blood, the person who, despite it all, she was closer to than anyone else in the world, had tried to have her killed, as far as she was concerned, the scenario was not possible. Even with Sonny's doubts, Jean was subsequently charged on multiple counts including conspiracy to commit murder, two counts of burglary, possession of a firearm, and two counts of false imprisonment. Given the overwhelming evidence against her, it would prove to be a short trial, with her being sentenced to 26 years in prison on May 8, 1998. As far as Archie and Yoshi went, sure they had played a major role in the crime, but they had done so, at least in part, under duress. As far as the courts were concerned, though, they were willing enough participants in the whole thing that they were each tried as co-conspirators. Archie ended up serving 14 years behind bars after being convicted of first-degree burglary and two counts of false imprisonment, with Yoshi serving four years. That said, even though the case was then settled, it wouldn't do much to stop the larger Korean-American community from getting involved, with them someone surprisingly supporting Jean. The community banded together and pleaded for leniency in Jean's sentencing, with them claiming that the whole thing was overblown and that fights between siblings were just part of Korean culture. Some would even go as far as believing that Jean was innocent of the crime she had been accused of, with one person believing that she was far too smart to have failed in such an attempt. Seeing an opportunity to manipulate even more people, Jean would play up to this, continually claiming that she had no idea what those two boys were doing in her sister's apartment that afternoon. As for the larger public, however, they would largely side with Sonny. Seeing her as an innocent who had been a victim of her crazed sister made it easier for people to present the whole thing in terms of a traditional good versus evil narrative. As we've seen though, while it's undeniable that Jean was guilty of attempting to have her sister killed, it's not quite as simple as her being the evil one and Sonny being the good one. Instead, this is a story with far more shades of grey than that, 
One where two sisters who had gone through a difficult upbringing and often found solace in each other would see that bond periodically be broken by an intense sibling rivalry and mental health issues likely passed on to them by their mother. It was only Jean, though, who took things to a level which would have been impossible to come back from had it succeeded. As the media circus picked up and she became public enemy number one, Jean would try her best to retreat from the whole thing. Sunny, meanwhile, would be only too happy to put herself out there, because with her being the clear victim in the public's eyes, she would do a number of interviews over the months that followed, telling her side of the story and building up further sympathy over the horror she had endured. And as more and more information started to come out, people would only grow increasingly intrigued by this Shakespearean tale of one sister constantly feeling like she was living in the shadow of another, only for this to lead to her plotting the ultimate revenge. To them, it was like something ripped straight out of folklore, especially when you took into account the fact that the two were identical twins, and so for one, seeing the other do better was like looking at a mirror image of what their life could have been if fate was kinder to them. As it happens, there's a psychological phenomenon known as the twinning reaction, which may have been able to provide the explanation as to why this went down the way it did. Basically, the twinning reaction is a process where the emotions between twins begin to intermingle closely, an example of which would be the stories we've heard of one sibling feeling another's pain and, as a result, being alerted to them being in danger, despite the fact that they may be miles away. In other cases, though, it may present itself as a twin feeling rage at their other half and deciding to take it out on themselves in the form of self-harm. As was perhaps the case here, it could be a situation where one feels such self-hatred over their own situation that this anger eventually manifests itself outwardly toward the sibling. Could it be then that when Jean was planning to have her sister killed, she subconsciously wanted to end her own life? It's certainly a theory some psychologists have floated and one which continues to have some merit to this day. Not that that explanation would provide much solace for Sunny, though, because, at this point, perhaps as a result of dealing with the trauma that had happened, her own life would begin to spiral. Not long after the attempted murder, she attempted suicide when she took 35 sleeping pills, only to be saved when paramedics discovered her and rushed her to the hospital. That wouldn't be the end of her fall, though, because from there, things would get even worse with her now starting down the path of prostitution when she became unable to hold down a job any other way. Meanwhile, as if a result of Sunny's life falling apart, the scales would now tip in Jean's favor as while in prison, the incarcerated sister would spend her time bettering herself by earning an associate's degree in social and behavioral sciences. This may seem like an ironic degree to choose at first given everything which had happened, but perhaps this was a way for Jean to understand herself and figure out why she had done what she did. After all, in her own words, she would explain her choice by saying, quote, I'm interested in anything to do with behavior and social patterns, because I recognize my old behavior and how it ties to my personality at the time, the person I was before I committed my crime. As the years went on, Jean would eventually confess to being the mastermind behind the whole incident, with her admitting that at one point she really did want to kill her own flesh and blood. That said, she also claimed to have felt much remorse by then, and it would partially be this acceptance of responsibility which led to Sunny speaking to her sister's parole board in 2017 and requesting that she be released from prison. As far as she was concerned, by now her sister had paid for her crime and had learned her lesson. And given the fact that her mother was older and suffering from diabetes, someone was going to have to look after her. Sunny couldn't take on that task as, after her own fall from Grace, she had become estranged from Kim. So this meant that now, after all of these years of her being the perceived favorite daughter, she would be usurped in the role by Jean. After spending 20 years in prison, Jean Han was released on parole in 2018, with her now being the one to take care of their mother, all while she was simultaneously gaining an engineering degree and finding stable work in the San Francisco Bay Area. It seemed like, as in fables of old, there's always one twin who's able to leech all of the good qualities from the other, leaving them with only ashes to work with as they struggle to build a life. While at one point Jean was considered to be the evil twin, you can now argue that this had become Sonny's role, though whether these roles will switch again at some point remains to be seen. Perhaps if the sisters came together once more, then maybe they could work it out in a way that would help each other, 
But at this time, it appears neither Jean or her mother Kim has had any contact with Sonny in some time. I use this show to tell the stories of people I refer to as monsters, and I think at one time, Jean Han was one. She wanted to have her own sister murdered over petty squabbling, but in this story, it makes me wonder if a monster has to stay a monster. I've presented many examples of people who were monsters and never changed their ways. After multiple stints in prison, they continued to get out and carry out evil acts among society in general. After being caught red-handed, they continue to deny their involvement and shout from behind bars about their innocence when the evidence shows otherwise. Jean seems to have gotten herself out of the cycle that caused her to want to commit murder, but only time will tell if she really has changed or if she's just a monster in hiding waiting for the opportunity to strike again. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.